In this study, we're going to discuss or try to investigate who is Esau. Some people say Esau is Saudi Arabia. Some people say it's Rome. Some people even say it's Ishmael. You know, who is Esau? Both from history and from the Bible and from what we call extra biblical text. Now, the thing I find interesting is that when we discuss even who is Israel, I have people asking me, well, you know, how come you say everyone who is black is Israel? That's not what I said. The people who are Israel are those who fit the prophecies of Deuteronomy 28 and other prophecies in the Bible, okay? Not only do they fit the prophecies of Deuteronomy 28, we talk about Israel now, they also have a historical connection back to Africa, back to a group of people who claim to be Hebrews, who has history and traditions of being the true Israelites, and uh, extra biblical texts and writings that show that Israel was a black people. So, you know, don't don't come to me with all of this, you know, you can't say that Israel black people because we're mixed. Don't give me that, okay? Maybe you should watch the videos, sit through and learn a few things first. Now, for Esau, how do we identify Esau? Through prophecies, just like we did for Israel. We identify Israel through the prophecies of Deuteronomy 28. We're going to identify Esau through the prophecies of the Bible and the scriptures in the Bible. That's how you identify Esau. How else do you identify Esau? You look for historical connections and historical works that also help identify who Esau is. Now, the problem with most people, and, and, and I don't know if it gets to you, but it gets to me, is that people make generic statements like, well, Esau could not be the white man because Jacob was the black man. So Esau cannot be the white man. That, that's illogical. That's, that's silliness. That's, that's not scholarly research. Okay? You cannot make these type of assumptions, right? You, you have to let the scripture speak for itself, and you have to let history speak for itself. You can't just say, well, Esau is the, is the Arabs because they're hairy. You can't do that. Okay? You have to use logical analysis, right? How the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little. That's how you search the scriptures. Now, when you look in historical texts, you have to try to find valid historical documentation. Now, sometimes that's less left up to the person who's doing the research to evaluate whether or not that, that information that he's looking at is valid. So, you know, don't come at me with, okay, now all white men are Esau. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Can I make that any clearer? I'm not saying all white folks are Esau, and you'll see that. I'm saying some white folks are Esau. So let, let, let's get a clear understanding of where we're at. And let's not talk about this multicolored coat stuff of Israel. Let's not talk about that everybody mix. We know everybody mix. The Bible tells you how to identify Israel, and it tells you how to identify Esau. Let's continue. So to determine who Esau is today, we have to do some investigations, like a private eye or a detective would do. You cannot start off with a faulty premise like Jacob and Esau were black, Therefore, Esau is a man of color and not white. You can't do it. The entire world was black at one time, people. This is supposition on your part or on the part of someone who makes these types of statements. They're only looking at the surface. We know who Israel is by the prophecies he fulfills and historical texts. We can also find out who Esau is by the prophecies he fulfills. We also have to look at extra biblical texts like Jasher, and the war scrolls. 
Although I believe that many of the texts like Jasher and Second Ezra should theoretically have been considered cano canonical. Okay? That's my opinion. Now, you don't have to accept the extra biblical text, but at the very least, it's historical. So you can use it as a valid historical view of who people thought Israel was or who people thought Esau was. So fraternal twins, what is a fraternal twin? Twins can be either monozygotic, identical, that meaning that they develop from one zygote, which is one egg, okay, which splits and forms two embryos, or dizygotic, fraternal, meaning that they develop from two different eggs. In fraternal twins, each twin is fertilized by its own sperm cell. So Jacob and Esau, according to what we see in, in the scriptures, Jacob and Esau were fraternal twins. Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 and 27. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because he was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be, so why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So the elder shall serve the younger. Now, before we go on, we see something interesting here is that there's two nations of people in, their, in, their, in, in her womb. Two manner of people, right? They're distinct. They're different types of people. Now, normally, uh, if you're a, a twin, okay, you're one people, right? Like, for instance, we know that Jacob and Esau were Hebrews. Normally, both will be Hebrews. But here, the Bible is telling us they're two distinct people. They're two different people, two manner of people. So there's a huge distinction or difference between these two. Verses 24 to 27. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. So remember, we started off looking at fraternal twins. That means there were two separate eggs, right? And, and, and they were fertilized by two separate sperms. So, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. So what do we see here? Esau knows how to hunt, right? He's a man in the field, so he knows how to grow food, you know, uh, vegetables and all those things. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. So what does that say? Jacob was living in the house. That was it. Jacob was living in the house. So here we see Esau, he's a dangerous dude. Not only does Esau hunt, he can grow his own food, he can do all these things. But you know what? It's interesting that he didn't, he couldn't cook it, right? <laughs> he had to come back and trade his birth right. But let, let's continue. So let's look at verses 25 and 26. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out. And his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. So now let's look at the CEB's version. It says, when she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered that she had twins. The first came out red all over, clothed with hair, and she named him Esau. Immediately afterwards, his brother came out gripping Esau's heel, and she named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old. So so here we see that he was hairy, and he came out red all over. So he's a red guy, you know. You know, for a lot of black folks, we understand what it means to be red, right? A lot of us uh, in the in what we call the black community, but we're the Hebrew Israelites. Uh, there's many of us of different shades, and some of us are like a brownish red, and uh, some of us are called red, 
be, because we're, we're a reddish type color. So uh, some people will try to say, well, look, uh, Esau was red and David was red. And so therefore he was white. No, 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 no. Let's use the Bible. So what did Esau look like? Instead of Esau being black, Esau was red like the red heifers that were sacrificed. If you look at this picture on the right, there's a kid over here, a child, you know, he's sort of reddish color and he's hairy. So Esau was hairy like the picture on the right. Now, you cannot make a determination from these texts that Esau was the white man from Saudi Arabia or from Saudi Arabia or anything else. An investigation has to start. So we have here two fraternal twins, one black, one red. Okay, so here we see black. Jacob was black. Esau was red. Okay, this is the reddest color I'm talking about on the right, that, that there's many blacks who are what we call red. So Jacob was the color of his parents. Now, verse 26 says, uh, it, it tells us that Jacob came out gripping Esau's heel. Now, what does this symbol mean? Because this is a symbol. Now, current canon does not give you the definition of what that means, but the Apocrypha does. So we turn to 2 Ezra chapter 6, verses 8 through 9. It reads, And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the hill of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, excuse me, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So the symbolism here is the reason why Jacob is grabbing Esau's heel because Esau is the beginning of the world, right? I mean, the end of the world. Esau is the end of the world. That's why Jacob is grabbing his heel. So Esau is the end of the world. So at the end, right? And what's the end of the body? It's the heel. At the end of the world, Jacob is going to rule. So Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So here we see that Esau came out first and will rule the world for this dispensation all the way up to the end of this dispensation. But Jacob will rule in the dispensation that follows. This is why the scripture states that the elder shall serve the younger. We will see more concerning this verse as we continue. So in the end, in the, in the fulfillment of everything, the Messiah, who is from the tribe of Judah, right, who's the descendant of Jacob, he will rule, okay? But also we must understand that Israel will rule with him. Now, those who are grafted in, who are born again of the Spirit, they will rule as well. But there's hierarchies in heaven, okay? And Israel is going to be the leaders, okay? The, the top, let's say, if you want to say, if we want to look at corporations, Israel would be like the CEO, right? And then everybody else will fit in there somewhere in their hierarchy. So... um the apostles asked, Lord, is this the time that you're going to come to, to implement the kingdom? And he says, it's not for me to know it, but it's for the Father only, right? So they were looking for Israel's rule to return. Because at that time, Rome was ruling. And Rome is still ruling today. So Esau was red like this red heifer. The word red and red heifer is Adam in Hebrew. The word for red describing Esau is Admonai, both from the same root word, Adam. So that's why it's called Edom. Edom means red, like this right here. You see that? You see the heifer and, and how our ancestors, the true Hebrew Israelites, how they would sacrifice the red heifer, right? This is the type of red heifer that we're talking about. So when the Bible refers to red, it's referring to this color. So let's look at Esau's descendants. Genesis chapter 36, verses 1 through 8. Now, these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Okay, so we know Esau is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholamabama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivat, the Bashmate, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabahoth, and Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashemat bare Reu, and Ahobama bare Jesus, and Ajala, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. 
And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Remember that. Esau's descendants continued. And these are the generations of Esau and the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Raul, the son of Bashma, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Raul, Nahath, and Zerah, and Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Bashemoth. Esau's wife. So God hates Esau. Now, a lot of people in Christianity say, you know, God doesn't hate anybody. Well, the Bible teaches different about that. The Bible teaches that God hates Esau. Esau. So if you turn to Malachi 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. This is a divine revelation. The Lord spoke his word to Israel through Malachi. I loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how did you love us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? I love Jacob, but Esau I hated. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and his inheritance to the jackals in the desert. The descendants of Esau may say, we have been beaten down, but we will rebuild the ruins. Yet this is what the Lord of armies says. They may rebuild, but I will tear it down. They will be called the wicked land and the people with whom the Lord is always angry. You will see these things with your own eyes and say, even outside the borders of Israel, the Lord is great. So we have a, something going on here. The descendants, remember this, remember the descendants of Esau, not Esau himself. The descendants of Esau says, we've been beaten down. God had allowed us to be beaten down. Okay, but they say, you know what? We're going to rebuild. So they're in, they're in rebellion against the Most High. Okay? They're always in rebellion. They're in rebellion in, against the Most High. And you know what? God doesn't say you're not going to rebuild. You know what God says? You, yeah, you may rebuild, but if you do rebuild, I'm going to tear it down. Okay? So, so there's this contention between Esau and God. Esau has no respect for the Most High. So let's read this in the Living Bible Translation, verse 4. And if his descendants should say, we will rebuild the ruins, then the Lord Almighty will say, try to if you like, but I will destroy it again. For their country is named the land of wickedness, and their people are called those whom God does not forgive. So in this translation, we see once again, is the descendants of Esau, and they're at war against God because God does not want them to uh, rebuild. But they say, we're going to rebuild. God kicked them out of Mount Seir. But they're like, hey, you know what? We don't care what you say. We're going to do what we want. Who does that sound like? Does it not sound like the devil? Okay. And if these people want to do their own thing, as the devil wanted to do his own thing, who do you think they're going to hook up with? So what do we know? We know that Esau and Jacob were what? Twin brothers, fraternal. Two, Esau came out red and hairy. Jacob came out normal, a.k.a. black in color. Esau sold his birthright. Esau is known as Edom. And number six, Esau's descendants are at war against God. So here's my theory on why Esau is not a people of color today. Since God hated Esau and is always angry with Esau, as we saw, he's probably... Esau is probably under a curse. Now, don't get this wrong, uh, you know, people who are not melanated. I'm not trying to make this a racial thing. I'm just trying to be true to the text. So, in the Bible, having white skin was a curse. It was called being leprous. So, okay. So, according to the Bible, 
And you go look at it yourself. If you had white skin, you was a curse. Right? Now, Israel was under a curse. Deuteronomy 28 curse. So, it's no big thing that people were under curses. I mean, Israel was under a curse and still under a curse. Now, we should be coming out of this because our 400 years is coming to an end. But if you had white skin, according to the Bible, read it yourself, that means you were under a curse. And I'm not trying to be mean, so I'm not trying to be racial. Now, many times in the Bible, when God was angry with someone like Moses, sister Miriam, and Gehazi, they were turned white. Go read those scriptures for yourself. Since God is angry with Esau, and he's always angry with Esau, it's possible that Esau was turned white. Now, I, I don't have any proof text in the Bible on what happened to Esau in terms of color, but it can't explain why Esau does not look like his brother. Everyone had color in ancient days. So let's stop for a second. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? Ham, we know, was black. Almost 99% of people agree with that. Okay? Now, we who are Israel know that Shem was black as well. But, but even if you don't agree that Shem was black, okay, you have to agree that Ham was black for the most part, right? I would think you would agree that with that. So if Ham was black, then everybody was black. You're not going to get black from white, but you can get white from black. So everybody was of color at one time. So let's not act like uh, it's some crazy miracle that you have these two different people. Like, you know, I, I've, I've heard people say stuff like aliens and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, come on, let, let, let's, let's, be, let's have common sense. Okay, we see proof text in the Bible where someone is turned white, and it's not a good thing. We see where Gehazi was turned white. It was not a good thing. So let's read that. Second Kings five twenty seven, the leprosy thereof of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. So here God is talking to the to to Gehazi. Okay, that leprosy will cleave. Not only to him, but to his children. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. So, so here it says forever and his seed forever. So there's a group of people and their descendants who are white because of this curse. That is if you believe the scriptures. Okay, so regardless, we have an example or a foundation to believe that a group of people today is white because of a curse, right? We have Gehazi as an example. We have Miriam as an example. We have, we have when Moses went before Pharaoh and put his hand in in his breast and put it out and it was white, put it back and it was its normal color. Then if it turned white, then what was his normal color? His normal color had to be black, okay? Minimum his normal color had to be of some darker hue. So Esau's sons. Eliphaz, Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gotham, Kenaz, and Amalek. Now, I didn't spend the time to go through each one of these, right? I picked three. I picked three to make a point. And as, you, as we go along, you're going to see what that point is. So Amalek, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. And Saul smote the Amalekite from Havilah, until thou comest to shore, that is over against Egypt. So, where was Amalek? Amalek was in the land of Havila. Where is Havila? If you look at this map on the left, you will see the whole land of Havila. On the right, you will see where Saudi Arabia is. What does that look like? It's the same landmass, correct? Havila is the same location that Saudi Arabia is, right? So, can we not? then make a, an assumption that the same people who are living in the land of Havila are the same people who are living in Saudi Arabia today? Can we make that assumption that the ones, the Amalekites, who are in Saudi Arabia today are descendants of Esau? I think we can make that connection. Now, am I saying that Esau is Saudi Arabia? I'm not just saying that, that Esau is the descendants of Saudi Arabia. 
because it's more complex than that. Uh, what it is, we look at it as a, 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 a single um, event or a single person, right? And we think in terms of this person or this group of people is Esau. But what happened is you have to understand that Esau had descendants as we saw. Okay, no descendants of Esau are at war with God. So here, I'm making my case for point one, that the Amalekites are the Saudi Arabians, are the people who live in Saudi Arabia. That the descendants, one group of descendants of Esau, called the Amalekites, live in the landmass of Avila, which is in modern day terms, Saudi Arabia. You're also going to see that in Yemen, you have Timon, who was one of the other sons living in that landmass of where Esau currently dwells in Havilah. So Saudi Arabia equals Amalek. So as we see, Amalek was in the territory of modern-day Saudi Arabia. So when people say that Saudi Arabia is Esau, they're not incorrect. In reality, they are descendants of the Malachites, who is a son of Esau. Just because people look different today does not mean they aren't related. They marry different people groups, but they are still blood. So, who are the fake Jews? Ashkenazi Jews are descendants of Khazars. We know that Ashkenaz is a descendant of Japheth. However, if they are Khazarians, then they are probably not descendants of Japheth. So, what we have here then is someone who's even not only pretending to be Israel, but also hiding amongst Japheth. So, in Wikipedia, we see the Turkic peoples are a collection of ethnic groups that live in Central, Eastern, Northern, and Western Asia, as well as parts of Eastern Europe. They speak languages belonging to the Turkic language family. They share to varying degrees certain cultural traits and historical backgrounds. The term Turkic represents a broad ethno-linguistic group of peoples, including existing societies such as, and I'm not going to read all of these, I'm going to read Khazars. You see that highlighted right there in big bold? Khazars. Okay, so we know from many other researchers, researchers that the, the Ashkenaz are descendants of King Bulan, who was the king of the Khazarians. Okay, I'm not going through to prove that part. If you want to learn about who they are, go look at other research. I mean, there's a ton of research on the internet by their own people who claim that they are descendants of the Khazars. Even some of their own writings say that the Ashkenaz are descendants of Khazars. So I'm not going to debate that here. Okay, I'm just making a point that here we see that the Khazars were a Turkic people. So here's a book, it's called Psalm 83, it's by Alexander Zypher, and it's called Psalm 83, A New Discovery. I'm going to read this on the left, it says, The Greek historian Strabo wrote of the two related tribes of Odomantes and Edoni dwelling in Central Asia. The Ottomans descended from the Ottomantes. The ruling family of Turks was called Osman, which comes from the Turkish name Othman. Othman was the founder of the Ottoman dynasty. These Ottoman Turks descended from the Ottomantes or the Timonai of Edom. So remember we saw Edom as one of the descendants of Esau. According to J.M. Roberts in the Penguin History of the World, these Osmani Turks or the Oghuz Turks, a descendant of Husham, was Alphandan, who had two sons, firstly Tur, who ruled over the Edomites in Central Asia. This may be the origin of the Turkestan. The Encyclopedia Britannica says that there are two branches of Turks, the Western and Eastern. The Western group from Southwestern Asia settled in Anatolia, Turkey. The Eastern Turks inhabited Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and other regions in Southern Russia and China. There are many varieties of Turkic people, but Western Turks are predominantly white and generally of the Caucasoid race known as Ugas Turks. Other date and circumstances of the descendants of Timans moved to their new homeland of Turkey. The Britannica explains that Western Ogus Turks, known as Seljuks, migrated into Iran. So, here we see that Timan 
who was a descendant of Esau, okay, one of his children, right, who was a descendant of Esau, was associated with a Turkish group of people, right? They're associated with the Turks and the Ottoman Empire. So we have a proof text here, right, that the Timon were Turkish. So Esau is also tied to Turkey. So Timon is one of the sons of Esau, and it appears that Timon may be the modern-day Turkish people. This would make sense because we know that the Ashkenaz or the Ashkenazi Jews are Khazarians. Now, Khazarians are a Turkish people and therefore not truly descendants of Japheth, but of Esau. So remember that Esau's family was huge. Esau's tribe was so big that it scared Jacob. And we can see this enlargement based upon their lineage listed in Genesis alone. Esau did not disappear, just like Jacob, also known as Israel, did not disappear. Esau exists, but they don't want you to know who Esau is because then you will know who your enemy is. And guess what? You're surrounded by them. Yemen. In Yemen, you have what they call the Yemenite Jews. They're also referred to as Teman Jews. And we saw that Teman was the son of Esau. So according to Wikipedia, Yemenite Jews was also called Temani. This is because they are descendants of Esau who practiced Judaism. Teman, Hebrew, in the Hebrew, you can see that, was the name of an Edomite clan and of its epinomen, according to the Bible, in an ancient biblical town of Arabia Patria. The term is also traditionally applied to Yemenite Jews and is used as the Hebrew name of Yemen. So, Teman is applied to Yemenite Jews. Now, if you're the true Jews, why would the son, of Esau, why would his name be applied to you? Why would you be referred to as teeming Jews? In Wikipedia, we see that Yemani or the Timani language is a Yemenite Hebrew language. They call it Hebrew. And it also referred to as Timani Hebrew is the pronunciation system for Hebrew traditionally used by Yemenite Jews. The Yemenite Jews brought their language to Israel through immigration. Their first organized immigration to the region began in 1882. So here we see that not only did the, did the Yemenite Jews refer to themselves as Tamani Jews, their language is referred to as the Tamani language or Tamani Hebrew. So the Yemenite Jews are descendants of Esau, not Israel. You can also tell that these descendants of Esau have a little reddish color to them as well. So that can tie us back to when things started changing on the color front. Now, if you're a Jew, why would you refer to yourself by Tamani, right? A descendant of Esau, unless that was your forefather. Now, you must understand, and we're going to continue on, is that, you know, Esau practiced Judaism. Esau in all practical purposes, was a Jew. Now, I'm not saying he is a Hebrew Israelite, okay? I'm saying he is Jewish, right? So even uh, Josephus states that anyone who converted to uh, what we call the true Judaism of the Bible or, or the true beliefs of the Bible or the practices of Judah or the beliefs of Judah, they were referred to as Jews. So whether you came from Rome, whether you came from Africa, if you if you can if you convert it, you were considered a Jew, right? They don't teach you that. But but that's what Josephus states. So so here we see that we have a descendant, a descendant of Teman, who's who's a, a son of Esau. We have descendants who claim to be Jews. Okay, so this is from the Jewish Library uh, about Edom, and that's the subpages of Edom, and you can find it that way. A decisive change in the relation between the two nations took place in the days of John Hyrcanus, end of the second century BCE. Hyrcanus conquered the whole of Adumea and undertook the forced conversion of his inhabitants to Judaism. So here we see 
that her, her canis conquered all of Adumia. Adumia is Edom. Okay, this is where the Edomites live. And remember, Edom is Esau. So her canis conquered Edom, right? So therefore, the Adumians became a section of the Jewish people, Adumia becoming one of the ordinary administrative districts of the Hasmonean state. It appears that the Hasmonean dynasty used some of the respective families of Adumia to establish its domain in that country. During the reigns of Alexander Yanai and his wife, Alexandra Salome, Antipas, who was an Adumean, served as ruler of Idumia on behalf of the Hasmoneans. Herod, appointed king of Judea by the Romans in 40 BC, was his grandson. During the reign of Herod, Idumia served in general as the firm basis of his authority. He considered the Idumeans to be much more loyal to him than the Jews and also depended upon them for the military settlement in Transjordan. 3,000 Edomites being settled in Terracon. So, what happened here? Hyrcanus conquered Edom. Right? Now, when Hyrcanus conquered Edom, Edom was converted to Judaism, which is the religious practices of the Orthodox Jewish people, right? So they were converted to Judaism. So once again, as we saw with the Yemenite Jews, we see that there was a conversion of Esau to Judaism. So now we also see that Hyrcanus put in power the Herod dynasty, right? And the Herod dynasty ruled Judea for the Romans. So even here, we have a connection, both between Rome and Esau. Now, let's look at the other son, Zepho. Zepho is also a son of Esau. Let's read Jasher chapter 61, verses 23 to 25. And at the revolution of the year, the troops of Africa continued coming to the land of Chikittim to plunder as usual, and Zepho, son of Eliphaz, heard their report. And he gave orders concerning them, and he fought with them, and they fled before him. And he delivered the land of Kittim from them. And the children of Kittim saw the valor of Zepho, and the children of Kittim resolved, and they made Zepho king over them. And he became king over them, and whilst he reigned, they went to subdue the children of Tubal and all surrounding islands. And their king Zepho went at their head, and they made war with Tubal and the islands, and they subdued them. And when they returned from the battle, they renewed his government for him. And they built for him a very large palace for his royal habitation and seat. And they made a large throne for him. And Zepho reigned over the whole land of Kittim and over the land of Italia 50 years. So what do we see here? Zepho, a descendant of Esau, another one of his sons, reigned over Kittim. And Kittim reigned over the land of Italia. Now, we all can say, based upon our English understanding and the fact that English is a Latin-based language, that Italia is Italy, right? So Zepho ruled the whole land of Kittim and over the land of Italia, which is Italy, for 50 years. So now we have another connection between a, a son of Esau and Rome. Or Italia. So not only that, we see that Zepho was king over Kittim. And Kittim would soon be considered the Roman Empire, what we what we know as the Roman Empire. So Kittim. Kittim was a settlement in present-day Lanarca on the west coast of Cyprus, known in ancient times as Kition, or in Latin, Sitium. On this basis, the whole island became known as Kittim in Hebrew, including the Hebrew Bible. However, the name seems to have been employed with some flexibility in Hebrew literature. It was often applied to all the Aegean islands and even to the west in general, but especially the seafaring west. Flavius Josephus records in his Antiquities of the Jews that Sethemus, son of Javan, possessed the island of Sethema. It is now called Cyprus, and from that it is that all islands in the greatest part of the sea coast are named Scythian by the Hebrews. 
and one city there is in Cyprus that has been able to preserve the denomination. It has been called Citius by those who use the language of the Greeks and has not, by the use of that dialect, escaped the name of Setium. The expression Isles of Kittim, found in the book of Jeremiah 2.10 and Ezekiel 27.6, indicates that some centuries prior to Josephus, this designation had already become a general descriptor of the Mediterranean islands. Sometimes this designation was further extended to apply to Romans, Macedonians, and Seleucid Greeks. The Septuagint translates the occurrence of Kittim in the book of Daniel as Romans. 1 Maccabees 1 1 states that Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, had come from the land of Kittim. In the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Kittim is referred to as being of Ashur. Eliezer Shutnik argued that this reference to Ashur should be understood to refer to the Seleucid Empire, which controlled the territory of the former Syrian Empire at that time, but his son, Yigal Yadin, interpreted this phrase as a veiled reference to the Romans. So, you need to go through and verify the references in Wikipedia, okay? Um, I'm not going to go back and do that because I've already verified the references, right? Because some of you say, well, you know, amateurs use Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a good source. You just got to, you know, make sure your sources are correct and that the references are legitimate references. Okay, so here, there's something we, we see here that I think many of you didn't catch, okay? And what I think you didn't catch, other than the fact that I, I, I'm sure you caught, is that Kittim is wrong, is that in the Isles of the Gentiles, we, we see that's where the descendants of Japheth lives, right? The scriptures talks about in Genesis, I believe Genesis 10, that the Isles of the Gentiles is where Japheth lives. But here we see that Kittim took over. Rome took over the Isles of the Gentiles, right? So now you have a mixture of Esau, right, Kittim, with Japheth. So when you say that the white man is Esau, I mean, that's partially true, not completely true, because some white people are of Japheth. So in the book called A History of Arabs in the Sudan and some account of people who preceded them in the tribes inhabiting the fur by H.A. MacMichael, uh, we see uh, what the Arabs refer to or how the Arabs refer to the Romans. The Romans, El Raum, are descended from El Raum, son of Esau. So we see here they're saying that the Romans are descended from Esau. So here's another text that says that the Romans, and we saw before that the Romans are Kittim, are descended from Esau, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, the friend of God, and they are named after their ancestor. It is related that Esau had 30 sons of whom Aaron was one, but the Romans had been joined by tribes that did not belong to them, namely Tanuk and Nod, and Sumia and Goshen, these tribes were in Syria. And when the Muslims drove them out, they entered the lands of the Romans and mingled and multiplied with them and were reckoned as Romans by descent. But they are not Romans, and the Roman genealogies know this as a fact. So here we see that these tribes, or some of the tribes that were not associated with the original Esau tribes, that, that they ended up mingling with people in Syria. Okay, or uh, the, the Assyrians, because Syria is part of the Assyrian Empire, right? And so, but they, they were not truly Romans, but they mingled with them. So, in fact, they are associated with the Romans. They're part of the Roman culture, and they intermingled and married. So now, and technically, you could say that, that the people in Assyria were Romans. So, Herod the Edomite. Many people do not know this, and, and it's amazing because, I mean, you know, when, you, when you're not really in the scriptures like you should be, uh, you don't realize that Herod was an Edomite. You know, if you read the Bible on a surface level, you think Herod was a Jew, but he was a bad Jewish king. No, Herod was an Edomite. So in 47 BC, Roman Emperor Julius Caesar promoted the Idumean Antipater to be an agent of Rome over Judea. 
Samaria, and Galilee. In 37 BC, the Romans named Herod son of Antipater as king over Israel. Thus, the Herods of the New Testament were Edomites. One of them killed the Jewish babies in his attempt to destroy Christ. Another Herod murdered John the Baptist. Another one killed James, the brother of John. So, we know from Scripture, right, that Herod tried to kill the Lord. And we see that Herod was an Edomite, who, which means he's a, a descendant of Esau, working for Rome, which, who, who is a descendant of Esau. So, it's interesting that Rome would have this relationship with, um, with, the, with, with Esau, right, because Rome is Esau. Okay, because remember, Zepho took over the Roman Empire. So knowing that Herod was the one trying to kill the Messiah, we see in Revelation 12, 4, that the dragon also tried to kill the Messiah. Are they one and the same? Are they of their father, the devil, as Scripture seems to say? So, you know, the Bible talks about this serpent seed. Is it possible, and I'm asking the question, is it possible that Esau is that serpent seed, that Esau is in alignment with the devil because we see in Revelation 12 4 that the dragon is the one that tries to kill the Messiah when before he's born we see that Herod is the one who tried to kill the Messiah before he was born but God protected the Messiah so wouldn't you connect that if it's the same event that these people are associated with the devil it's associated with the dragon and ain't no, isn't it no wonder that the Most High hates Esau? He says, I hate Esau. He said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So we must understand that, that there's something going on here, that there's a people out here who's, who's working for the devil and who's the enemy of Israel. And it just so happens it's the one whose birthright he, that, that got taken or that he sold, right? Because Esau sold his birthright for some red pottage. So he sold it. Now, granted, Jacob tricked him, but it was always prophesied that the elder shall serve the younger. So it was all part of the Most High's plan. But Esau was angry, and Esau stated, I'm going to kill my brother once my father dies. Now, many of you may have heard of the rat Rothschilds. The Rothschilds is the family in Europe that controlled the whole banking system and created the whole international banking system. In 1743, a goldsmith named Amschild Moses Bayer opened a coin shop in Frankfurt, Germany. He hung above his door a sign depicting a Roman eagle on a red shield. The shop became known as the Red Shield Firm. Now, is the red shield a sign of who they really are? Because, you know, you know, in Europe, you had, had those uh, emblems or those crests that, that show who you are. So could we rephrase this to mean an uh, Edom shield? Because Edom means red. When we saw that, Adam or not, Edom, it means red. So could the red shield be the crest for Edom? What is the symbol of America, Rome, Britain, Russia? It is the eagle. Maybe this is why the dragon in the book of Revelation is red. Red representing Edom. Just a thought. We see this on the left side, right? Red and the eagle. Over here, the red dragon in Revelation. It's interesting that now we sort of see a connection here of those who rule the world, right? And, and their emblem is that of a red shield. And Edom was called red. And so now we have a connection here that may, I'm not saying absolutely, that may tie us back to Esau. Now the Wall Scrolls. The Wall Scrolls is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I know uh, many of you probably never heard of it, but the Wall Scrolls is very interesting. And I suggest to you that you go back and read or, or at least watch some of our other videos dealing with the end times because some of the things I'm going to talk about may not make complete sense unless you saw those end time videos but they start to mesh and all come together like like uh, weaving a tapestry so this is the wall scroll column one 
for the instructor, the rule of the war, the first attack of the sons of light shall be undertaken against the forces of the sons of darkness, the army of Bilal, the troops of Edom, Moab, the sons of Ammon, the Amalekites, Philistia, and the troops of Kittim of Ashur, supporting them are those who have violated the covenant. So who do we see in the battle of the sons of light and darkness? But the descendants of Esau, Edom, Amalekites, Kittim, which is Zepho, ruled by Zepho. Now, I know some of you will say, see, Kittim is not wrong, but Ashur, really, really now. So the verse says the troops of Kittim of Ashur. We can rephrase that as the troops of Kittim that reside in Ashur. Remember we saw um, in the other uh, uh information that we were looking at concerning Esau and his descendants uh, that Ashur was one of those uh, who was involved in the conspiracy and who was involved with everything that's Esau. So, so Ashur, there's a connection between Kittim and Ashur. So we see Ashur as one of those involved in the Psalm 83 conspiracy as well. So who are the sons of darkness and of light? The sons of darkness are Edom, Esau, Moab, Ammon, Amalekite, Esau, Philistia, and Kittim, Esau. The sons of light are Israel, returning from their captivity back to the land. When the ex and when the exiles of the sons of light return from the wilderness of the peoples to camp in the wilderness of Jerusalem. And we're going to see more of this as we continue reading snippets from the war scrolls. So war scrolls continue. So the sons of Levi the sons of Judah and the sons of Benjamin, okay, those exiled to the wilderness shall fight against them, against all their troops when the exiles of the sons of light return from the wilderness of the people to camp in the wilderness of Jerusalem. So remember, if you saw our other shows, we talk about the wilderness of the people. And our contention is that the wilderness of the people is where we're at right now, okay? We're in the wilderness amongst the people. Okay, and then we're going to go to the wilderness in Jerusalem. And before we go back to the wilderness of, the, of Jerusalem, we're going to get all that wealth and gold and come back with the wealth of the Gentiles. And many Gentiles are going to come back with us. But let me continue. Then after the battle, they shall go up from that place. And the king of Kittim shall enter into Egypt. I believe that to be the Antichrist. In his time, he shall go forth with great wrath to do battle against the kings of the north. And his anger he shall set out to destroy and eliminate the strength of Israel. Then there shall be a time of salvation for the people of God and a time of dominion for all the men of his forces and eternal annihilation for all the forces of Bilal. There shall be a great panic among the sons of Japhet. Why is Japhet concerned? Because Japhet is living amongst Esau. Assyria shall fall with no one to come to his aid and the supremacy of Kittim shall cease. That wickedness be overcome without a remnant, there shall be no survivors of the all the sons of darkness. So remember, we saw what was Esau known as wickedness, right? And and so here we see that God is going to destroy all of the children of, of darkness, which most a lot of them are made up of the descendants of Esau. So then the sons of righteousness shall shine to all the ends of the world, continue to shine forth until the end of the appointed seasons of darkness. Then at the time appointed by God, his great excellency shall shine for all the time. So remember, in Isaiah chapter 60, God says, rise and shine for your light has come. And the darkness, you know, because remember, in Isaiah 60, darkness covered the land and gross darkness to people. And God pours his spirit upon his people. So his people are going to be shining, right? So what happens is, if you look at some of the other end time videos, Israel goes back to the land, and Israel is back in the land for a while, and then the enemy comes back to want to uh, take a spot. Uh, what scrolls continue? Uh, for eternity, for peace and blessings, glory and joy, and long life for all sons of light. On the day when, the, when Kittim falls, there shall be a battle and a horrible carnage before the God of Israel. For it is a day appointed by him from ancient times as a battle of annihilation for the sons of darkness. On that day, the congregation of the gods and the congregation of men shall engage one another, resulting in great carnage. The sons of light and the forces of darkness shall fight together to show the strength of God with the roar of a great multitude. 
In the shout of God's and men, a day of disaster. It is a time of distress for all the people who are redeemed by God. And all their afflictions don't exist that is like it, hastening to its completion as an eternal redemption. On the day of their battle against Kittim, they shall go forth for carnage in battle. In three lots, the sons of light shall stand firm so as to strike a blow at wickedness. And in three, the army of Belial shall strengthen themselves so as to force the retreat of the forces of light. And when the banners of the infantry cause their hearts to melt, then the strength of God will strengthen the hearts of the sons of light in the seventh lot. So the great, the great hand of God shall overcome. So here we see that there's a war. There's a war going on between Israel and the sons of darkness. And that's the descendants of, e of Esau and their allies. Okay, now, if you look at our other end time videos, as I mentioned, we talk about a war that occurs when is after Israel's back in the land. Ezekiel chapter 38 talks about how the kings are going to come back and say, you know, I, that they come to take a sport against the people who are at rest without walls or gates. <clears throat> so we see that after Israel's in the land without walls and gates, they have to fight. <clears throat> and after they fight, after they fight, they're going to get to a point where they're losing. Okay, remember, you'll see in Zechariah where a third of the city is taken. Okay, so here we see in the War Scrolls that, that Israel falls back. Remember, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, they fall back a little bit. But in Zechariah chapter 12, you will see that Judah... Right, and even the old men of Israel, they're gonna fight like David and like the angels. Okay, so we see that here in the war scrolls that there's this huge battle, and this is the battle of Armageddon. Ezekiel 38 is the battle of Armageddon. The war scrolls here, what we're looking at, is the battle of Armageddon. This is Joel chapter 3, where Jesus, Yeshua, when he comes back, he says, I'm coming to deal with the nations for what you've done to my people. You made a boy a harlot and you sold a woman for wine. This is that battle. And the Most High is going to come back because it's going to get to the point where we look like we're going to lose. And you can see that here. It's, it's going to be, you know, head to head. And, and each side is not going to be given ground. But then that's when Jesus comes back or Yeshua comes back and he's going to deal with these nations in the Valley of Megiddo. So here we, we, we're seeing... The, 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 the clarification of what's going to happen during the time of Armageddon, which the Bible says there's no time like it, never will be again. The Bible says don't hope for the day of, of wrath because it's a day of darkness, gloominess, right? So this is going to be a serious confrontation. So they don't teach you this in church. Why they don't teach you this, this in church? Because this not going to pay tithes. People don't want to hear this. This don't make you feel good. But those who want to know the Lord, those who want to know the Messiah, those who want to know the truth of the scriptures, they will eat this up. They will absorb it, even though there's some darkness that's going to happen. But the Bible tells you that there's going to be darkness. Let's continue. Bilal and all the angels of his dominion and all the men of his forces shall be destroyed forever. The annihilation of the sons of darkness and service to God during the war years. The holy ones shall shine forth in support. The truth of annihilation of the sons of darkness. Then a great roar they took hold of the implements of war. Chiefs of the tribes and the priests. The Levites, the chiefs of the tribes, the fathers of the congregation, the priests. And thus for the Levites and the courses of the heads. So... Second Ezra 6 9 says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. In the Raw Scrolls, we see that it is mainly the descendants of Esau, they're also known as Edom, that we are fighting along with a few of their allies, like Ammon. So Esau and their allies are fighting against Israel, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. The battle in the Raw Scrolls is Armageddon. It is the last battle we fight after being in the land. So like I mentioned, read Ezekiel 38, read Zechariah 12, okay? Now, if you want more information, look at our end time videos. This is the statue that we see in the book of Daniel, where Nebuchadnezzar is that head 
of gold or Babylon is that head of gold and the 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 arms and the breast are Media and Persia and the the uh, bottom part of the body is Greece and the legs is of iron which is Rome and the feet is iron mixed with clay so Esau is Kittim I think we proved that and Kittim is wrong so all of the evidence seems to support that Kittim is wrong and that Kittim in times past was conquered by Zepho, a descendant of Esau. Both in the War Scrolls and the statue that the prophet Daniel saw showed that Kittim, also known as Rome, is the final ruling power. This fulfills 2 Ezra 6, stating that Esau would be the ruling power before the Messiah returns and before Jacob takes over rulership. We can now see that Saudi Arabia is probably Amalek and the fake Israeli Jews are Edomites, as well as descendants of Timon. Psalm 83. Now, the same players, as in Psalm 83, are the same players we see in, in the War Scrolls. Keep not thou silent, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thy enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be no more remembered. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacle of Edom and the Ishmaelites of, of Moab and the Hagarines, Gibal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Ty, Ashur. Remember, in the War Scrolls, Ashur was associated with Kittim. Also is joined with them. They have helped or hoping the children of Lot. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as in Caesarea, and to Caesarea, and to Jabin at the brook of Kishon, which purchased at Endor, or perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and Zemunah, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. So I've talked about this scripture or the, you know psalm 83 in the fall of the gentile powers if you haven't seen it go watch it and I, I show you how this plan and we see edom again which is esau and we see that it's also amalek involved and we see Ashur involved which is associated with kittim it's, it's esau leading this thing with their allies right who who made this plan to take God's people as a possession or take the houses of God as possessions. So the sons of darkness are the same ones who enslaved Israel. They are the ones who stood in our way when our ancestors tried to escape Rome in 70 AD. Obadiah chapter 1. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the, in the day that strangers carried captive, his forces when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity. Nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Matthew 24, verse 2. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to the, his buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left upon another. Everyone will be thrown down. When Rome conquered Jerusalem, no stone was left upon another as prophesied. Psalm 137, verse 7 confirms that it was Edom who did this. Remember, Edom is associated with Kittim. Kittim is Rome. Rome conquered Jerusalem. Rome destroyed the temple. Psalm 137, verse 7 says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who say it, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. That tied them perfectly with Matthew 24, which showed that Edom was the one involved with that. So who fits the prophecies? Genesis chapter 27, verses 38 through 41. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me so, O my father. 
And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother. So here we see Esau says he's going to slay his brother. We see that Esau is a family of nations. Most of these nations are allies today. In Daniel's statue, the final world empire is the Roman Empire. Most scholars agree with this. The Roman Empire continues today in the form of the European nations. These nations have conquered the world through colonialization, fulfilling Genesis 27 verse 40, that Esau would live by the sword. Colonialization also fulfills Daniel 2.43 of the mango seed. Now that's another teaching I might have to do. Because Jacob's kingdom is coming, and Esau's rule is coming to an end. Rome is building a world government, the beast of Revelation 13, to resist the end of his rule. Is Esau the white man? Not all white men. Certain nations of white men, and it appears Esau is hiding among Japheth. So Esau is white, but not all white men are Esau. Just like some people are black, and not all black people are Israel. Okay? So Esau, there, there, there's several things we know about Esau. Esau would be a part of a confederacy to enslave his brother, Psalm 83, 12. Esau would be ruling at the end of the world, 2 Ezra 6, 8-9. Esau's descendants would be at war with God, Malachi chapter 1, verse 4. Esau and his confederacy would be fighting Israel once they are back in the land. Wall Scrolls, Kanye 1, Zechariah 12, Ezekiel 38. Esau would live by the sword, Genesis 27, 40. Esau would live in luxury, Genesis 27, 39. Esau and Eden would say, raise Jerusalem and the temple to the ground, Psalms 137, verse 7, fulfilling Matthew 24. So finally, we know that there are those who claim to be Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Now, who better to fit this than Jacob's brother? who grew up in Judaism, as we saw, who ruled Israel during the time of the Messiah, who also hates Israel because he stole Esau's birthright. I think the case is closed on who is Esau now. And I think a better job has been done in explaining why some white men are Esau. Now, let's not get caught up in the color thing because everyone gets caught up in the color thing. Just because you're black don't mean you're Israel, and just because you're white don't mean you're Esau. Okay, so we must understand this. And Esau has been hiding himself amongst Japheth, which is why the Ashkenaz referred to themselves as Ashkenaz, because they were living in Germany where Ashkenaz was, which is a descendant of Japheth, living amongst the Japhites. So we must understand that just as Israel had a prophecy, that had to be fulfilled to identify Israel, such as Deuteronomy 28 and many other scriptures. And then there's a historical connection as well back to the people and back to the land in Africa who has a, who has a history of a connection to Judaism and practices of Judaism and, 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 and circumcising on the eighth day. You know, there's a ton of proof about who Israel is, just as now we're starting to see that there's proof of who Esau is. See, Esau has not wanted the world to know who he is. Okay, so he made it a little difficult to find him. But you must do like an investigator. You must do like a private eye. You must do like a private investigator and look for the signs. First, you must look in the scriptures and say, what did the scriptures say about Esau? What did the scriptures say about Edom? Okay, most people stop at Mount Seir and, and Petra and things like that, where that's not enough to identify. You must trace the steps. You must look at ancient historical documents. You must look at pseudopedagraphy. You must look at the scriptures to build a case. And if they harmonize and if they don't conflict, right, 
then we can say, ah, I think I understand that. So we must understand that Esau, Esau is white, but Esau is not all white people. The Lord will make thy enemies thy footstool. Psalms 110, verse 1. We see in the scriptures that Esau is at war with God. We saw that. And we saw that God hates Esau. And that God says he's not going to forgive them. Why is that? What is Esau doing that is so bad? We can see it today. We can see this European colonization effort and what they've done to the world. We can see them destroying the earth. We can see them destroying people. We can see them destroying babies. And definitely we can see them attacking Israel. So currently, we're in a war. Israel, you are in war right now, which is why you're being killed on the streets, which is why police are shooting you, which is why you don't get any justice. The scriptures speak of this, but the ones doing it is Esau. Esau might be white, but Esau is not all white people. So we must make that distinction. Now, for those who are born again of the spirit, I'm not talking those who are just Hebrew Israelites by blood. But I'm talking about you Hebrew Israelites who are born again, right? The ones who are ready to enter the kingdom because they trust in the work of the Messiah. I'm talking to you. We must show forth love to all people, to all races, right? Because what is God? God is love, okay? So we must show forth what our Father is, right? The devil is a liar, and the people who follow the devil are liars. The devil is a killer, and the people who follow the devil are killers. Esau is a killer. Esau is a liar. Okay? But if we follow the most high, Yah, and Yah is love, then we must be loved. So we can't walk in hatred, right? Because hatred will consume you. But understand that the Lord will make thy enemies thy footstool. Now, we know that this scripture is talking to the Messiah, that the Messiah, that every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So everyone's going to be under his foot. But those who are born again, are in the Messiah, right? We're in that vine. We're grafted in again. So just as the Messiah steps on the devil's head, we steps on, on the devil's head. So understand, people, we are in a war. And Esau is our enemy. And now you can figure out that Esau is made up of many people. Esau has descendants who are at war with God. It's not one people. It's not just Saudi Arabia. It's Saudi Arabia. It's Rome. It's Turkey. It's the Yemenite Jews. And there's probably others too as well because I'm sure as you look in scripture, you see other Turkish descendants who, who live in what they call Asia, which is the area of Ukraine, which is where you know the ancient land of the Khazars were, who live in Russia and who live in that whole area over there. They're all descendants of Esau. And they're going to come against us one day when we're back in the land. Okay? But the Most High is going to fight for us. Now, the question is, how much time between all of that? I have no idea. One thing I do know is that the 400 years is coming to an end. Now, if we're going to be on track on time, you know, then that would mean 2019 we out. We'll see. That I don't know. I don't predict things. I just look at things and say, maybe. So be blessed. Shalom. Love you with the love of the Messiah. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. Peace out.